Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Idaho State Museum. My name is Liz Hobson, and I'm the museum administrator here, and I want to thank you all for joining us for this special program to commemorate the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066, which authorized the forced removal and mass incarceration of over 120,000 Japanese Americans during World War II. The Idaho State Museum is part of the Idaho State Historical Society, which includes the Idaho State Archives, the Old Idaho Penitentiary and Historic Sites located throughout the state, and the Idaho State Historic Preservation Office. We offer dynamic and engaging programs that have served Idahoans across the state and have done so for the last 140 years and look forward to many more years to come. We also have a lot of Idaho State Historical Society members in our audience today, uh, so we want to thank you all for joining us and supporting all of the work we do for the state of Idaho. Before we begin, I have some housekeeping items. We will be taking questions after the program. Uh, you will find a card on your chair that you can feel free to write questions down on. And also on your chair, you will find a survey. We would love for you to fill that out and let us know your thoughts about today's program and how we can better serve you, our audience, in the future. And please put your completed surveys in the basket at the back of the room when you leave. We also encourage you to visit the M store during your visit today. You can purchase copies of today's film and other resources that share and look at Japanese American incarceration. We are also live streaming today's event and the panel discussion will be recorded and posted to our YouTube page uh, later tomorrow so that you can share or watch again. And joining us today are members of the Salto family that I would like to recognize at this time, wherever you are. Thank you. Uh, through their recent donation, the Idaho State Museum can now share the deep roots of Idaho's Japanese communities. Uh, I would love to invite you all to the special pop-up exhibit on display downstairs while you are here visiting today. Their story leaves visitors with a personal connection with the men and women who were incarcerated at Minidoka. We are truly grateful for your trust and your generosity. If you're interested in donating artifacts to the Historical Society, please let us know. And finally, this program has been a work of many, uh, and I am grateful to be part of this partnership. I would like to thank the National Park Service, Minidoka National Historic Site, the Friends of Minidoka, the Boise Valley JACL, the Boise State University School of Public Service, and the Idaho ACLU for all their hard work and dedication to this commemoration. It is now my pleasure to introduce the Executive Director of the Idaho State Historical Society, Janet Gallimore. Hello everyone, good afternoon. We're happy that you're here. Um, our agency preserves and promotes Idaho's history and our vision is to make history an essential resource for Idahoans. And it's through programs like this that we do that and connect the past to the present in a way that's very meaningful for the folks today, thinking about how we shape our future. It's my great pleasure today to uh, be able to introduce Wade Vegas, the superintendent of the National Park Service's Southern Idaho Parks, which include Craters of the Moon National Monument, Hagerman Fossil Bells Na Beds National Monument, and of course, Minidoka National Historic Site. It takes a great leader to lead great things, and that is the case with our friend Wade. We appreciate his partnership in programs such as this, exhibits, um, developing trunks for educational programs, and our work together as part of the work of the State Historic Preservation Office and the National Park Service in partnership on national policy issues pursuant to historic preservation. So thank you, Wade, for all of those partnerships. Um, but I'm thinking of this one right now. It was only two years ago when Wade gave very moving comments at the opening of the new visitor center at the Minidoka site. Um, that powerful site is a jewel in the National Park Service's portfolio, and we are grateful to Wade's leadership in telling the story of the people incarcerated there so that Americans can understand that history, learn from that history, and remember that history. So please do well, help, uh, join me in welcoming Wade to um, be able to announce our program today. And Wade, thank you so much for being here.
I'm having a really good day. How about the rest of you? Uh, Jan, thank you. And Liz and the entire board and the members of the Idaho State Historical Society for your support of this day of remembrance and your support of Minidoka National Historic Site, but maybe most importantly, your support of Japanese American heritage and culture and the stories. Um, and I also want to say a special thank you to the Boise Valley JACL again for your, your preservation of that heritage, that cultural heritage, and helping ensure that not just the civil rights and civil liberties of Japanese Americans are upheld, but also of all Americans. I'm going to go off script here for just a moment and just offer a remark or two about the National Park Service. And you know, our, our agency is well known. We're well known, particularly in the land conservation world. And so people think about places like Yosemite and Olympic, and Yellowstone and the Grand Canyon. I can see your shirt right there in front of me. And you think about large landscape conservation and, and that's synonymous with the National Park Service. But we also have far more to that in our mission. And we tell stories of things like immigration to this country at, at Ellis Island and Statue of Liberty. And we tell stories about the founding of this nation, places like Philadelphia and Independence Hall, uh, of First Nations, right? Places like Bandelier and, and others. And we also tell a really critically important story related to the events in the aftermath of the signing of the Executive Order 9066. And we tell it at places like Minidoka National Historic Site and Bainbridge Island, National Exclusion Memorial, Manzanar, Thule Lake, and I'm really pleased to announce we've got a new park coming into the National Park Service family here in just a few short days or a week or two at Amachi National Historic Site, which is a sister, will be a sister park to Minidoka uh, down in southeastern um, Colorado. So I'll go back to my script here for a moment. Um, a friend of mine who's in the audience, actually, Neil, where are you? Neil King. There he is. Um, Neil penned a piece earlier this week, and if you subscribe to the Friends of Minidoka uh, email distribution list, you may have seen it, and it was titled, Why I Care. Neil was the first superintendent of Minidoka, and so when the park was established in January of 2001, uh, he was down the river in, in Hagerman, and he got the nod from then director, regional director of the Park Service, to, to become the new superintendent of, of Minidoka, and he, he fulfilled that role and many more through his retirement in 2008, but his, his piece was, was opining on why he, his words, self-described old white guy should care, right? Why should he care about the injustices of the incarceration? And you know, he, he concluded two things. He concluded one, that the US Constitution is, is for us all, right? As, as Americans, it's for us all. But he also concluded that a violation of that Constitution, a violation driven by nothing other than, at the time, xenophobia, bias, right, against a race of people, is, is, is such that it compels him to speak. And so Neil wrote this piece, and Neil was probably less than 500 words, and I've been thinking about it all week long, and I wanted to thank you for it, all right? And so that brings us to why we're here today. We know, based on redress and the Civil Liberties Act, et cetera, that at the end of the day, bias and bigotry and hate that built over decades, coupled with a nation at war, and then ultimately a failure of political leadership led to the mass incarceration of Japanese and Japanese Americans, based nothing else on race alone, right? And we know today that that was wrong. And so today we pause and we remember and we reflect but I think for all of us, it's all equally important to take those lessons and look forward as we think about the world we want to live in and upholding the values that make uh, this such a great and special nation. And so tonight, it's my pleasure to introduce John. John is actually looks like he's heading for the back door there. John, you're not leaving us, are you? Okay. Uh, John Osaki is a filmmaker from the Bay Area of California. He has produced uh, tonight's film, which will be up on the screen here in a moment, Alternative Facts, The Lives of Executive or of Order 9066. And I think John does a really excellent job of really digging into not just the top line, kind of the above the fold byline of this story, but really what was going on politically and socially in the events 
up to and through the signing of the executive order. And along the way, he just tells a really, really amazing story of, of people and how people squared to the, the winds at the time to, to right a wrong. And uh, John, I commend you for your work and thank you on behalf of the National Park Service. And with that, I will go back to my seat and turn it over to, to the filmmaker. Thank you, sir. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Robin Achilles. I'm the executive director of Friends of Minidoka. And Friends of Minidoka is the nonprofit partner of Minidoka National Historic Site. And we support the site through preservation, protection, and education about the Japanese American incarceration story at Minidoka. I'm pleased to introduce our panel this afternoon. John Osaki is an award-winning filmmaker who has directed and produced promotional, educational, narrative, and documentary films, including Not Your Model Minority and Reparations. John's initial interest in film grew from his desire to share the stories of the Japanese Community Youth Council, where he has served as executive director since 1996. Leo Morales is the executive director of ACLU of Idaho and has managed the organization through significant growth. Prior to joining the ACLU, he worked with an Idaho-based statewide nonprofit advocacy organization addressing issues of poverty, including access to health care, affordable utilities, and safe working conditions. Leo has participated in local and national campaigns to bring justice for farm workers and immigrants. And then finally, we have Ronald E. Bush, a retired federal judge. From 2008 to 2021, he served as a United States magistrate judge, including as the chief magistrate judge of the United States District Court for the District of Idaho. Judge Bush was also instrumental in the creation and production of a stage play titled The Nisei Paradox, written by Jeff Thompson. If you could join us on the stage. <laughs> So John, I'm going to start with you. Tell us a little bit, why did you decide to make this film? Uh, sure. Well, first of all, I want to thank you all for being here. It's really a pleasure I've had. I've, I've been on sort of a tour with Robin. We did uh, Catch Him a couple days ago. We did Twin Falls yesterday. And I've really enjoyed, thoroughly enjoyed my time here in Idaho. So with regard to this film, it really came together. I, I had the really the pleasure of taking my family on a pilgrimage to the site of the former Tule Lake Segregation Center. And while we were there, I was, uh, I had brought my, my camcorder with me and being a dad, I shot a lot of footage of my children partaking in the activities there. And for anybody who's been part of a, on a pilgrimage, it's a very transformational experience and when I got home I decided to make a short film out of my children's experience and so I've been involved in the Japanese American community in the San Francisco Bay Area for over 30 years and so I thought I knew a lot about the incarceration story but I thought I had better brush up on my history just to make sure I had all my facts straight so as I was doing research I came across a report called Personal Justice Denied, which was the report that the uh, Commission on Wartime Relocation and Internment of Civilians issued, the one that ICO worked on. And as I was reading it, I realized just how much I didn't know. Um, all the people and the facts 
and really all the politics and all the issues that were really behind the incarceration story. And I thought it would make a great film. And I was sure that if I didn't know these facts that 99.6% Nine percent of the American public did not know them. And it also coincided in 2016 with a presidential election in this country. And I couldn't help but notice the rhetoric at the time felt so much like how it might have felt in 1942 where groups were being targeted and demonized and policies were being suggested about how we were going to treat not individuals, but entire groups of people. And so with these two moments kind of converging, that really is what led me to to make this film. And um, just really glad I had the opportunity to share it with you all today. John, I'm just gonna ask you to follow up a little bit. Could you tell us a little bit how you see the film relating to what we're actually seeing today, right now? Sure, absolutely. So I think what I was really struck by when I was making this film is how much the incarceration of my father and my mother and all of my aunts and uncles really was not about national security at all, right? The military was not even contemplating rounding up and incarcerating Japanese Americans immediately after Pearl Harbor. That did not happen until special interest groups white farmers, exclusionists got to their elected officials and those elected officials got to the military. And that's really what happened. And so I think that in, in today's world, you know, when you look back at what, what was really behind the incarceration of our community, it was really about, well, we're not sure which of you we can trust, so we're just gonna lock all of you up. I mean, that's essentially what the rationale was at the time. And it was not identical, but very similar to the idea of, well, we don't know who we can trust from these Muslim countries, so we're gonna keep them all out. And so I think that, you know, you can just see how the politics of fear and the way in which um, public officials today, unfortunately, cater to their political base uh, and sometimes are willing to buy into very false narratives about groups of people because they believe that it will appease um, those who support them. They believe it will help them win elections. And those, those, all those dynamics are still very much at play today. As long as people are seeking power in this country, we will always have to be vigilant against the factors that led to an entire community being incarcerated um, and why we are all gathered here today. Great, thank you, John. Leo, I would love to hear about, in your work, what issues in the film do you see in Idaho and nationally? Thank you, Robin, and, and, and thank you, John, for your incredible film. And, and um, you know, I, I, when I saw it, I thought, my goodness, there's so much I didn't know, right? And so thank you for that. You know, there's, there's a, a lot of themes that John already covered, too, with regards to the work that the ACLU is already engaged in nationally and, and here in Idaho as well. Of course, there was the point and the reminder of the Muslim ban that we saw in the video. Uh, and that is, is one of the, the, the areas that where the ACLU became very, very involved. Right, and I think uh, you know we've been have uh, the famous quote of the ACLU was "We will see you in court." Was you know was the quote that that um, moved around in, in social media uh, when um, the president um, you know signed an executive order to specifically go after individuals from specific countries. Uh, so the Muslim ban is one of those. Um, second, of course, and we saw this in the film as well. The ACLU has also been at the forefront. Uh, protecting the rights of immigrants, refugees, asylum seekers, particularly at the southern border as well, where we saw the rounding up and the sep- actually the separation of children from their parents. And again, there was a heart-wrenching uh, photos, videos of, of children being separated from, from their parents. And that's another uh, uh, issue that we've been working on nationally. Um, the one that I also want to point to 
that was not in the film or I didn't catch it um, was uh, shortly after 9-11 course, right? We saw the rounding up of individuals because of the color of the skin, because they were Muslims. And, you know, just, I think it was January 11th, earlier January was the 20th anniversary of when Guantanamo Bay was, was open. And to this day, it remains open. And we have individuals incarcerated uh, in, indefinitely, and with many of them not being charged with anything. And that is another issue that the, that the ACLU has also done some work. Uh, transitioning here to Idaho, a, a couple of areas uh, I'll touch on. Um, one is, uh, uh, in which, you know, hopefully there's a lively discussion today, is their work around critical race theory, which again, in the film, we see how misinformation or how, how sometimes individuals who want political power put together uh, falsities to begin to move their agendas. And that is another area we're very concerned with uh, in, in the state of Idaho and across the country. Idaho, I believe, was the first state to actually pass a law uh, to ban, to discourage the teaching of critical race theory, um, which really, right, it's, it's a law school level uh, type of teaching. And, uh, but it's made now, uh, it, it's, it's now been led to believe that it's being taught at the elementary level, at the middle school level, at the high school level, et cetera. And so that, that is one area that we're doing some work. And lastly, um, the Idaho legislature also passed a, a, a bill, HB 500, now law, to ban, um, to, 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 to prohibit the participation of transgender women and girls from participating in sports. And I highlight that as well because there are elements of the film with regards to the concoction of false information and false narratives to eventually move us in a, in a certain uh, direction. So those are the two that I'll touch here in Idaho. We're doing lots of work, but uh, I'll pause there for now. Great, thank you, Leo. Um, a lot for us to follow up on. <laughs> uh, Ron, do you have anything to add about the um, issues in the film and what you see today in Idaho? <laughs> Uh, thanks, Rob. And, and um, well, I think all of you would have something to add based upon uh, the additional information that you probably learned from this extraordinary film that John has made. But there are, are, are several points that I think I would like to bring to the conversation. One is the scope of what's happening in today's world in, in recent years in terms of what's happening uh, in the society uh, regarding uh, act actions directed against uh, minorities and disadvantaged um, uh, or marginalized uh, people. And I took a moment uh, last week to, to look at the, the FBI has a database where it collects uh, information from nearly 15,000 law enforcement agencies across the country about the types of, of uh, crimes that are occurring in, in their particular areas. And they break it down by type. Included in uh, those statistics are uh, hate crime offenses. Uh, now, uh, in these are ones that, uh, uh, these numbers do not include those that would not constitute a crime or do not involve violence, threats, or property damage. Rather, these are uh, crimes against individuals that um, are motivated by bias against race, color, religion, national origin, sexual orientation, gender, gender identity, or disability, and they're serious crimes. Uh, so in the country, uh, over the last year that the, the statistics are available is uh, 2020. Nationwide, there were 11,129 alleged hate crime offenses. Broken down, they included 62% based upon race, ethnicity, ancestry, 20% based on sexual orientation, 13% based on religion, and the remaining based on gender identity, disability, and gender. In Idaho, for the year 2020, the United States Department of Justice reported 54 hate crimes. Now, that may not seem like a large number, but it's commensurate nationwide based upon our population. More significantly, that number represented a 42% increase 
from 2019 and a 108% increase from 2018. The breakdown of those crimes followed similar lines to those nationally. So this is, this is an issue uh, that has reared its ugly head uh, in increasing numbers. And of course, there are uh, thousands of other incidents that go unreported to police. Um, and leaves, leaves the question of why and then how, what can we do to reverse that? Thank you, Ron. Uh, thank you, Ron. You know, um, just following up on your, just following up on that, and uh, you talk about um, the statistics about the hate crimes, and you know, one of the things that talk, was talked about a lot in the film was about educating and how important education is. So I'd like to follow up on your uh, comment about critical race theory and the laws that bar, te bar schools from teaching. Um, how, could you tell us a little bit more, how do you think these laws will impact the ability to tell the story about Japanese American incarceration. Absolutely. You know, part of, part of, um, part of this movement, because indeed it's a movement now, is about instilling a lot of fear, which is a tactic, right? It's a lot of fear about history, about the other, but particularly about uh, fear of others that are not white. And, um, and, and, and part of what's happening here now is they're, they're putting a significant amount of fear on, on, on teachers, on students, and administrators to teach history that sometimes uh, can be deemed by others as controversial. And uh, controversial, divisive concepts, right, is what's, what's been used on the other side. And what this does it, it, is that it slowly it begins to infiltrate uh, our institutions of academia at any level. And so at some point, if, if a student claims, well, th this, this type of curri curriculum is offensive to me, uh, this type of curriculum is scaring me, that eventually what begins to happen is that uh, the, 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 we, we move in the direction where the conversation stops. It stops in the classroom. And all of a sudden, what, what could, could happen, it's conceivable that at some point, individuals may believe that teaching and having a conversation about, about the incarceration of Japanese Americans is too controversial, is too divisive, and therefore we shouldn't do it. And so, and so I think that, again, it's, it's very concerning when we have a, a movement to begin to inject fear in the teaching of history because there's a concern, right, to, to as, as pointed in the, in the film, uh, um, a concern to have a, a full conversation about the true history of our, of our country, uh, the history of what happened uh, to enslaved community members, uh, what happened to indigenous community members, what has happened to, to Japanese American community members, right, Muslim community members, and so on. And so, you know, again, just more emphasis that it's extremely important to be able to push back because it is through conversations, through dialogue of history, that we, we can protect the future to make sure that, that everyone um, is protected with regards to their civil liberties and their civil rights and their human rights in, in this country. So just to follow up, what can you give us some specific things that people can do? Absolutely. So, legislatures are still very engaged right now as we speak across the country, right? Idaho has already passed this legislation. Uh, and, and in fact, individuals that push forward this legislation are still engaged at the local school district level as well. Now, there's a move to actually bring more individuals to be on the school board, right? Because so that's another level. You get individuals on the school board, it makes it more difficult. So what can we do? One, we have to continue to follow what is happening at the legislature, that's one. Second, we need to continue to be engaged at the school level, at any level of this of school to make sure that we push back. Third, continue to support organizations, individuals that are doing this work to be able to push back. Uh, it was, it, it, gosh, a few weeks ago, a few weeks ago, I don't think it was more than a month ago, that you know, at school, at administrators and teachers, uh, I'm skipping, I think it was, I, 
Gosh, I want to say it was a Boise School, not the Boise School District, but um, a particular county, I'm skipping it right now, their particular county that actually had to, to call on their own legislator saying, you're accusing us of teaching critical race theory. You've never even been to our school, right? So, involve it. Great, thank What's you. The point? Boise, Boise County, thank you. Great, thank you, Leo, that was great. You know, and as we talk about telling the story, you know, Minidoka National Historic Site tells the story of incarceration, but also Ron, um, I actually wrote, uh, as I mentioned, about the Nisei draft resistors in Minidoka and their trials here in Idaho. Ron, can you tell us briefly what actually happened? The, um, the film makes uh, mention of uh, those who resisted the draft who had been incarcerated in these camps. And that was true at Minidoka, even though, as many of you probably are aware, the Minidoka camp, uh, and I think uh, it may have been mentioned today, has a, had a higher percentage of individuals who ultimately served in the, in the armed forces uh, during World War II. And um, the, the highest percentage per capita per camp uh, of those who lost their lives in that service. But imagine yourself being a young man uh, who was uh, taken from uh, his home along with his family, uh, sent to Minidoka. Uh, when you got to Minidoka, the uh, War Department, uh, even though you were a United States citizen, classified you as an enemy alien. You were un ineligible to serve even if you wanted to. Uh, and then after some time, then the War Department changed its mind and said, all right, you can enlist if you choose to do so. And then after some additional time, when the War Department determined, well, maybe these young men uh, are, are pretty good soldiers. And of course, as, as the history shows, uh, fought valiantly on behalf of our country in World War II, uh, the War Department decided, well, we're going to draft you if you haven't already enlisted. And so some uh, of those uh, young men said, uh, we can't understand how that makes any sense. And they said, no. That was true in Minidoka. Uh, for 34 young men, they were arrested, charged with federal felonies, and they were tried in Idaho federal court. And this is one of those instances in, in this history that is, is not a good reflection on our government, and in this case, the judicial system. The cases were tried before Chase Clark, who was uh, recently appointed to that position by President Roosevelt. He had just lost his uh, election for re-election to the governor's seat. He had been governor of Idaho uh, at the time of these events, time of Pearl Harbor, the time of the debate over uh, the relocation of the coastal Japanese, and he had been extraordinarily strident in opposing any of that. He, among other things that he said in that time, uh, he said, um, I can't see us sending Idaho boys out to fight the Japs in the Pacific and then let them come back to find Japs in their homes and on their farms. Governor Clark then became judge and he was the judge for these cases. He was asked to disqualify himself for obvious reasons, he chose not to. The trials were perfunctory. Uh, about half of, of those individuals pled guilty because motions that they had been, had been filed on their behalf seeking to dismiss the charges were denied. The other half went to trial. Those that pled guilty were sentenced to, as I recall, about 18 months. Uh, the others were sentenced to a little over three years, all to be served in the federal penitentiary, and some of them were still serving those sentences after the camps were closed in 1946. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, John, you also have a story about a family story about a resistor. Could you share that? Um, sure, I'd be happy to. So uh, I'll actually start with a, uh, a brief story that I shared 
this morning um, in the governor's office. And that was about my father, who was 17 at the time uh, of the Pearl Harbor bombing. And um, he, growing up, had been uh, given a puppy uh, by his father. And um, as he was growing up, he, he raised this dog. And so what a lot of people don't think about is that um, when Japanese Americans were incarcerated, they were not allowed to bring their pets. And so um, he tried to find somebody to take his dog with him. And the, the hate towards Japanese Americans at the time was so visceral that he could not find a single person to take his dog because the people in his surrounding community considered that dog a Jap dog. And so when he was taken away, um, and I'll just share really quickly, even, you know, even after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, um, he immediately volunteered for the draft to be enlisted into the military. He was denied. And then when the trucks came to take him away, he had to sit in the back of that truck and watch his dog chase that truck for over a mile until it became so tired that it sat down in the middle of the road and he never saw that dog again. And even after going through that horrendous experience when he got to the Tule Lake Segregation Center, he volunteered a second time to serve in the military, to fight for this country, to put his life on the line for this nation. And he was labeled an enemy alien. So after two times of trying to volunteer for the military, he had had it. And in 1943, some of you may know that Japanese Americans were, were given what was called the loyalty oath. And you were asked to do two things. One, if you would serve in the military, and two, if you would um, disavow your allegiance to the Emperor of Japan. And um, I was sharing with Robin earlier today that the second question, um, he, he, he honestly thought it was a trick question that by disavowing his allegiance to the emperor meant that he at one point was loyal to the emperor. And so, you know, without any explanation from the camp staff and particularly the director, he answered no, no to both questions. And because of that, he was deemed disloyal to this country. And I think that for all of us, if we can just imagine that having everything that you own, um, having to discard it, having to sell it. I call it the great American fire sale. Many families only had days to liquidate all of their assets. So if you could imagine um, losing everything, volunteering for, to, for the military twice and being turned down twice, um, having the horror of watching your dog um, and never having a chance to see it again, um, while you're being taken away. And that was, that was the experience of my father during that time. And so as much as he loved this country, as much as he knew he was an American, he could not answer yes to those questions. Great. Could you each tell us about what the lessons are from the stories you just told us? Would you like to start, Ron? Sure. <laughs> Um, well, what you saw in that film is replete with lessons, and I'm sure you all recognized many of them. I, I will say that the one that resonates the most in my mind is that one of the things that we can be proud of in this country, but sometimes fail to do as well as we should, is, and we talk about critical theory, it's to be critical of what we have done in the past that fell short of what our, ide our ideals and our constitutional framework calls on us to do so that we can examine those moments in our history where we fell far short of what we should do. And even the Supreme Court in these cases that we've talked about today, Min Yasui, and Fred Korematsu, and Gordon Hirabayashi, 
That's the same court that in other cases uh, issued rulings that cemented important civil liberties and important civil rights. And they fell short in that case. And there's legal nuances to all of that, but, but Robert Jackson, the justice who dissented, spoke up for all of them when, or for, for many of us when he spoke of it that way. And Justice William O. Douglas later on said it was, was the saddest moment in his history on that court. But it's our ability to look within ourselves and to think about what we do and to ask ourselves whether what we're doing is the right thing to do, whether we have the integrity to understand that. And then also when we see others acting and making decisions in a way that we know is not consistent with our, our ideals, then what we should do is step out of the quiet shade of the tree and speak up and say so. That's what we always need of each other and of ourselves and the events of the Japanese relocation and internment brings that home to us in a way that we should carry on. So Leo, we see people like James Rowe and Edward Ennis who stood up for truth and justice. Could you tell us about some people here in the Boise area and in Idaho who have done that? Absolutely. You know, one person I would point to um, is Justice Jim Jones, retired. Justice Jim Jones um, <laughs> is... Um, ex uh, you know, we'll have time for a question and answer after. Could you please let the panelists continue? Thank you. Yes, and we can engage afterwards as well. But, you know, Justice Jim Jones, I point, you know, uh, with regards to the recent work that he's been doing, uh, Justice Jones, immediately after retirement, um, you know, started doing a lot more work to, to support and defend the rights and civil liberties of immigrants and refugees. Uh, Justice Jones, of course, has a history in the military and um, um, served in a, in, a, in a region where he became uh, very acquainted with the, with the local community. And after retirement, and particularly after the harassment, national harassment of the Muslim community, of the refugee community, uh, Justice Jim Jones, you know, began to, uh, beca became more engaged with nonprofit organizations on his own as well to make sure that, that he, he called uh, to, 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 to protect the rights of individuals. The, the other individual that I'll, I'll point to today is Lindsay Hecox. Lindsay Hecox is a young activist who um, wants to run track, is an athlete, and wants to run track at Boise State University. But the law that was passed, HB 500, denies Lindsay the right uh, to run. And uh, I point to Lindsay because Lindsay is one of those individuals that is standing at a moment in history where it is very difficult to stand. And that's why I point to Lindsay, uh, because I think that in the future, many years from now, we will look back and, and, and realize how critical uh, it was to stand up in difficult times. And so I'll point to those two individuals at this moment, uh, just so that there's more conversations for Q&A. Great, thank you. So I just would like to remind everybody that today the point is to have civil discourse. And so please let's, um, let's make sure to respect others, uh, what others have to say. So we, we actually have run out of time for our final, uh, but before we go to question and answers. So I would pose one last question to everybody before we take questions from the audience. What can we do as individuals in our communities going forward. Ron, would you like to start? Uh, thank you, Robin. I, I'm going to read to you a statement that was uh, written by James Omura. 
who was a uh, Japanese American who was the editor of a newspaper in Denver that uh, served the Japanese American community in Colorado. And he, he was someone that had spoken out very stridently against the relocation of the coastal Japanese and, and um, criticized what was happening and in turn was, was not uh, very well regarded in the Japanese American community because of that. But he said, uh, we cannot condemn democracy for our present unhappy predicament. Democracy is not only a form of government, but it is also a spirit. If there is not the spirit of democracy in our governmental leaders, we would not have democracy in action. Therefore, let us not condemn democracy, but the men who manipulate public affairs and the masses who sympathize and condone undemocratic ideals. So the question I would pose is, is that a, a statement that fits today in the way that it did then? And does it then ask us to move to action in some other way than what we have been doing? Great, thank That's you. All I have. Thank you, Ron. Leo? My two cents again is to continue to be active, right? Continue to be active, continue to participate. Um, you know, absent of our, our, our participation, you know, whatever, you know, democracy we may have now is in serious peril. And in order to protect those freedoms, those individual freedoms, uh, it is extremely important for all of us to be involved. And so again, as I pointed, whether it's at the legislative level, at whatever level of government, in community, in the sharing of stories as well. Sharing of stories is so, so critical. And in fact, it, I think it's, it's one of those that perhaps brings the divide together. It is through listening to each other, right? It's through having those conversations. And so I think it's, it's important to point that, and I think the film did a really great job of that as well. Um, yeah, I think those are my comments of just encouraging. And, and I also mentioned this earlier, again, is that support you know, uh, uh, your local organizations, your national organizations, because they're at the forefront of doing the work that's necessary of organizing as well. So thank you. John. Okay, so um, I, I just wanted to highlight, I think, uh, one of the people in the film, which was Aiko Herzig Yoshinaga, and um, getting a chance to meet her, film her, uh, spend the whole day with her, was just uh, really uh, the most memorable part of making this film, and um, got a chance to bring my daughter down uh, to meet her, and it's, it's an experience that she will never forget, and by the way, if you didn't make the connection, the very opinionated young lady in the film is my daughter. <laughs> but what really struck me about Aiko is that she was not a trained researcher. She had no special training in archival work. She was just somebody who simply had the will to find the truth. And in doing so, she changed the course of history. And I think for myself, and I certainly do not put myself at her level, uh, I am not a trained filmmaker. Um, I have I'm never gone to film school, um, but I felt compelled to tell this story. And I am, this is the, um, the eighth screening I've had in the last two weeks um, in different parts of the country. And I was compelled to do so <clears throat> because I think it's so important to focus on truth. At the, at this moment in our country. And I am willing to do what I can as an individual to make, to spread this information, to make sure as many people know it as possible. Unfortunately, I meet with uh, schools and classrooms and students too often who tell me that the only thing they are taught about World War II and Japanese Americans is that Pearl Harbor was bombed. And that is the extent of what they are taught in their classrooms and they have no idea that this even took place. And so I think it is incumbent upon all of us to make sure that as a country, we learn from our mistakes. I'm a big believer that you learn more from your mistakes than your accomplishments. And this is a great, great country. We have so much to be proud of, but there are also so many things that we still have to atone for in this country. And so much we have to learn from to be uh, the nation that we, 
you know, we strive to be in a more perfect union. So thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, John, Leo, and Ron. And we have some questions from the audience. Is the failure to learn from our history, slavery, attempted genocide, wartime internment, race-based incarceration, anti-immigration laws and crusades, et cetera. Is it a uniquely American failing or is this just the way of the world? Who would like to take that? Well, I'll, I'll just speak to it very quickly. I mean, it's an interesting question. I, there's certainly pieces of all that that are the way of the world and not just in the United States and in other parts of the world, extraordinarily egregiously so. What is different is that uh, in not always consistent ways, um, our country has come to account in some way for its failings. And um, we can always have differences of opinion about how well that's been done or if it's been done sufficiently or if it's been done at all. But I think that our history can fairly be viewed as one in which we do address such things and we do try to uh, remedy is a poor word because some things there are simply no remedy for, but certainly to try to bring some manner of justice to it. Um, and this is one such instance. Would you like to add anything? My two cents, you know, I, my background is in, in political science as well. And so I got trained with like, you know, systems of power. And so I, I guess I would answer this question from that perspective as well, is that throughout history, what we see is that those in power, right, use that power to move whatever agenda. Those not in power are wanting to get power. And, and I think that, you know, in this country and in the world, there's, there's, there's different systems that are at play and there's different interests that are at play. And I think that that also has, has created the history that we have in this country and the world. Like, um, uh, enslaved people, the system of slavery was in part economic, right? And so those were factors that were that significantly influenced um, uh, the fact that we have this very dark, dark chapter in the country. I, I also do believe that it is through the under, it is through the to, through the understanding and to the uh, studying of history that should shed the light for how we can be better, right? Uh, so controversial now, which shouldn't be in my opinion, is the 1619 Project, right? The 1619 Project, which challenges all to look at the history of this, the, 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 how the, the emphasis we should put on, on, um, on the foundings of this country. And so again, I, I just point to the fact that again, it's, it's, it's studying our history, so that, uh, as I think it was Ico that, that mentioned this, so that we don't repeat this again or something similar, um, right? And so I'm a firm believer of that. And I think it's critical to open up the spaces so that there's equity with regards to uh, uh, attainment of, of information, right? We continue to live in a society uh, where individual community members uh, that don't have access to schools Oftentimes, you know, the education is a little bit different when compared to elite institutions as well. So again, I think it's the analysis and the tearing down of systems that I've sometimes denied uh, individuals and students that right to study history and to proactively move forward. So my two cents. Great. Thank you. I actually have another question. For the Muslim travel ban, did the Supreme Court defer to Korematsu? Or did they defer to the authority of the president? What was the basis of the decision if facts did not support any threat from refugees? Well, I can give you my very non-legal um, assessment of that whole situation, but it was, <clears throat> I worked very closely with the attorneys who uh, reopened Fred Korematsu's case in 1983. And they submitted an amicus brief as um, for the travel ban case, 
really citing the parallels to demonizing uh, a group of people and creating policies without any evidence. And so I think that during in the uh, ruling of that case, the Supreme Court did uh, did denounce Korematsu, but at the same time in upholding the travel ban essentially reaffirmed it. And so for, I know for the attorneys that I work with, there was a, a deep level of disappointment that the moment had finally come for the Supreme Court to address U.S. v. Korematsu and they, while denouncing it, reaffirmed it. And so I think that that is, as far as the, from their standpoint, there is still a tremendous amount of unfinished business because they're, because of the outcome of, you know, Trump versus Hawaii. Well, uh, there are so many great questions and we've actually run out of time. Um, so if you did not get your question answered, please come up to the panelists after to ask your questions. But there's, uh, there were just two um, additional questions that I'll uh, answer when we do our closing. Um, we do invite all of you to visit Minidoka National Historic Site um, and its new visitor center. So Minidoka National Historic Site is located in Jerome, Idaho. Um, and the park opens again on Memorial Day weekend. So that, that answers, uh, someone had asked what, how you could uh, visit. And we actually, there's a table downstairs so people could access the information um, at the National Park Service table. We would like to thank our panelists once again. We deeply appreciate them for sharing their time and insights. Uh, we also want to thank the Idaho State Museum for hosting this event and to the National Park staff for all they do to ensure that the Minidoka story is continued to be told. In closing, uh, we would like to read a very short poem. Well, first of all, let's thank our, thank our panelists. <laughs> And to conclude, we wanted to read a very short poem. It's by Larry Matsuda, who is a survivor of Minidoka. And he had an op-ed published in the Idaho Statesman uh, last week. And this is from Glimpses of Forever Foreigner. And his poem is called Legacy. When hecklers circle a North Seattle mosque after 9-11, I won't turn my back in silence knowing vultures will descend on shuttered stores and homes when hate stains holy walls. Who will stand on granite moss stairs, link arms with brown brothers and sisters? I will stand for my mother and father who 60 years ago could not against US Army bayonets, Browning rifles, President Roosevelt and Executive Order 9066. I am like an alien abductee who walks among the living, knowing the pain and humiliation of being taken while most white Americans look away. I have no nightmares about gray creatures with spindly fingers pushing needles into my belly button. My stomach is a chunk of black basalt, heavy like a meteorite, weight that disappears only when I stand. With only one lifetime to swing a pick, toss dirt, haul ore, I hoist a lantern in black tunnels, slide my hands to atomic bonds, meld them with stalactites and stalagmites of justice. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. <laughs>